Chapter 4 Daedalus Abolished Full oft the riddle of the painful earth Flashed through her as she sat alone Yet none the less held she her solemn mirth And intellectual throne Tennyson God, we'll simply have to dress the character I want puce gloves and green boots Buck Mulligan His face glows green His hair grays white His blithes become brune To sweet his cultic toilette Finnegan's Wake In a book from a quayside cart I shall go away in a little while And travel into many lands That I may know all accidents and destinies and when I return, will write my secret law upon those ivory tablets. I know nothing certain as yet but this. I am to become completely alive, that is, completely passionate. For beauty is only another name for perfect passion. I shall create a world where the whole lives of men shall be articulated and simplified as if seventy years were but one moment, or as if they were the leaping of a fish, or the opening of a flower. The Tables of the Law and the Adoration of the Magi, privately printed for William Butler Yeats in 1897, now within a year or two consigned by Dublin to the quayside barrows, like a carbuncle excreted by a goose. Just as poets and painters and musicians labour at their works, building them with lawless and lawful things alike, so long as they embody the beauty that is beyond the grave, these children of the Holy Spirit labour at their moments with eyes upon the shining substance on which time has heaped the refuse of creation. That supreme art which is to win us from life and gather us into eternity like doves into their dovecots. And I understood that I could not sin because I had discovered the law of my own being and could only express or fail to express my being and I understood that God has made a simple and an arbitrary law that we may sin and repent. He turned and said, looking at me with shining eyes, Jonathan Swift made a soul for the gentleman of the city by hating his neighbour as himself. Swans tossed on the wake of the liffy tugs. This was surely the image of the forgotten Dublin that had set them there, his intellect playing over these words in the city of fishwives, trams, and broken fanlights, Joyce could soon repeat both stories word for word, by heart. There is ardour in the record of his fascination with the monk errants Ahern and Robartes, who strode through them with great strides. Their speeches were like the enigmas of a disdainful Jesus. Their morality was infrahuman or superhuman. Stephen Hero and his brother remembered for forty years his account of accosting a capuchin on the beach and reciting to him the adoration of the Magi amid the solitude of sun and roaring waves. Very beautiful, very beautiful, murmured the monk. Yeats's own account of the persona that mobilised these stories, I had gathered about me all gods because I believed in none, and experienced every pleasure because I gave myself to none, but held myself apart, indissoluble a mirror of polished steel, makes it sound very plausible. A disdainful arrogance purified of the operatic clangour of continental Byronism. A fructive tranquillity seemed within his grasp. He moved, it seemed, slender amid bristling burghers, aloof and serious. He infuriated Dublin virtually without effort. The Countess Kathleen was booed by Joyce's college classmates. The next morning, Joyce alone refused to sign their manifesto against the play. Yeats's persona proved more reliable than himself. Two years later, his treacherous instinct of adaptability was temporarily making terms with the rabblement, and Joyce took upon himself the responsibility for continuing the war against Muflisme. He launched a pamphlet against the official taste of a nation that has never advanced so far as the miracle play, where... The rabblement, placid and intensely moral, is enthroned in boxes and galleries amid a hum of approval, la bestia triomphante. No man, he began, 
quoting the outcast, Giordano Bruno, can be a lover of the true or the good unless he abhors the multitude. Abhorring the multitude, Yeats had done the finest Irish writing of Joyce's time. Joyce accordingly adopted the role of Faustian glamour. In the enigma of a manner that he set about constructing, he joined the names of Stephen, the first martyr, stubborn in his visions against the hurled stones of an infuriated city, and Daedalus, the artificer, who, being denied safe conduct off a tyrant's island, ignotas animum dimitit in artus, turned to obscure arts and fabricated wings that bore him above the amazed gaze of shepherds and plowmen. The signature of Stephen Daedalus appears three times in print, appended to stories published in A.E.'s Irish Homestead in 1904, The Sisters, a narrative of sacerdotal paralysis, Evelyn, portrait of a Dublin girl too terrified by the implications of exile to flee with her sailor lover beyond the seas, and After the Race, which images in Jimmy Doyle a possible Jimmy Joyce who remained in Dublin. The priest is a frustrated Saint Stephen, Evelyn, a frustrated Daedalus. To have become an esprit libre seemed a suitable climax for a triumphant novel. So for ten years Joyce wrestled with the life history of Stephen Daedalus. An autobiographical draft puzzled him by the refusal of its lines to converge on the desired heroic climax, and was abandoned in 1908 after a thousand pages. When it became clear at length that the climactic image comported with a more taut, neurotic, and less intelligent character than himself, He created such a character as a dandyish alter ego, and in A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, excised the diphthong from the hero's surname, so that Daedalus chimed with dead. The struggle of a complex spirit in an unexampled predicament cannot be covered by a paragraph. The Yeatsian postures, for instance, were facile enough. Pater plus French decadence at second hand via Simons to be sloughed off quickly before they could interfere with the writing of Dubliners. They left superficial marks on The Sisters, which Joyce later rewrote with some difficulty. Two other martyr personae, Bruno the Burner, in Dictor of the Roman Bestia Triumphante, Dick Turpin, Turpin Hero, Stephen Hero, picaresque discomfiter of lawyers and clergymen, never engaged his interests very deeply. Ibsen, encountered about the same time as Yeats, afforded a subtler and more dangerous model, because he seemed to have liberated himself from the lyrical dream. All Joyce's ruthless honesty didn't dispose of the Ibsenite temptation to be as a god until the writing of Exiles in 1914. During 1903 and 1904, he worked out an Aristotelian aesthetic theory that seemed to set the whole problem in order by clarifying a mode of contemplating Dublin with active vigilance within a total experience not repudiated but possessed. Yet the speculative exactness that could regulate the artist's practical problem couldn't solve it any more than Einstein could blow up Hiroshima with the page of his notebook. The problem of how to liberate himself from Dublin without losing touch with it was thoroughly resolved only in practice, as its phrases presented themselves in terms of jobs to be done, books to be written. That took until 1914. The last two books... 1914 to 1939, presented technical problems only, continuously solved from page to page at a technical level, how to render phase-by-phase material with which he was at last completely in touch. The books up to Exiles and A Portrait summarise a struggle to get in touch with Dublin in this fruitful way. Yeats and Chamber Music The first practical problem was to go on from chamber music, to get from the lyric phase to the epic, to shift his own emotions out of the foreground without sterilising them. This meant developing chamber music, not discarding it. The poems, fortunately, weren't smeared. Joyce had at no time allowed the lyrical impulse to blur a poem into an image of satisfaction. He had set down accurately what he felt, and the paradoxes of that scrupulous empiricism remained as data for subsequent exploration. The temptations of Yeats were laid almost as they arose. Joyce's poems echo the wind among the reeds, 1899, often enough to indicate a radical criticism of the elder poet, whose lyrics are, precisely, images of satisfaction, not without a deadened ache at the core. 
If Yeats, note, it should be understood that what follows isn't a fair view of Yeats, but what I take to have been the young Joyce's, it is rather similar to that of Dr. Leavis in New Bearings in English Poetry, had died in 1899, it is unlikely that anyone would feel he had more to do. His early poems, and especially his early plays, project a full and coherent world, like the world of Swinburne or Morris, apparently answering to every desire and impulse of their creator. What he understands is enacted sharply at the centre. What he does not yet understand, but confusedly apprehends, is present in his poetic world as a surrounding greyness of the order of I am haunted by numberless islands and many a Danon shore where time would surely forget us and sorrow come near us no more, which it does not seem incumbent on him or on us to penetrate. There is a similar evasiveness about his swagger. To his heart, bidding it have no fear. Be you still, be you still, trembling heart. Remember the wisdom out of the old days, him who trembles before the flame and the flood, and the winds that blow through the starry ways. Let the starry winds and the flame and the flood cover over and hide, for he has no part with the lonely, majestical multitude. Neither the fear nor the wisdom gets sharply defined. Glamour, not intrinsic to the verse, but imported, along with the key images from the pateresque last prose page of the Tables of the Law, muffles the sense. Yet the glamour is controlled by a poise of steely dignity. The solemn hieratic rhythm itself differentiates, be you still, be you still, trembling heart, from the bankrupt's lavishness with which Morris and Swinburne dispense their tinfoil counters. Ten years earlier, William Morris had been able to say to Yeats with truth, you write my sort of poetry. What Yeats had been doing during those ten years was fusing the aesthete with the aristocrat, a fusion that Morris and Swinburne could never perform. The Irish tradition of impoverished aristocracy cultivating the arts furnished him with a homegrown solution for the disabilities of the aesthete's congenital languor. In his parallel poem, 21 in Chamber Music, Joyce drew on the analogous strength of Ben Jonson, who contains the whole tradition of gentleman poets since Horace, to give this fusion still more stress. He who hath glory lost, nor hath found any soul to fellow his, among his foes in scorn and wrath, holding to ancient nobleness, that high, unconsortable one, his love is his companion. The first four lines translate Yeats's stage properties into spare directness of presentation, with, in the opening phrase, a glance at Lucifer. Among his foes in scorn and wrath, holding to ancient nobleness, is dry beside Yeats's endemic melancholy, but it is the concluding couplet that turns the screw. Yeats's lonely majestical multitude manages to blunt lonely by multitude, and turn flame, flood, and the winds of space from terrors to glories with majestical. Joyce's, that high, unconsortable one, his love is his companion, deletes a romantic lady love with unconsortable, and turns the Lucifer into Narcissus. He evades neither the attractiveness of the role nor its penalty. He differs from Yeats in understanding exactly what he is saying, Whenever Joyce rewrites a Yeats poem, half close your eyelids, loosen your hair, into be not sad because all men, I hear the shadowy horses, into I hear an army charging, we find a poise less assured than Yeats, who in 1899 was 12 years older than Joyce in 1904, but an articulation considerably more efficient and a sense of the contradictions in the pose considerably sharpened. The Strategy of Nobility Joyce didn't set out so much to improve on Yeats as to do what he could, better than the early Yeats did, with the conventions he had to use, which Yeats also had to use. There is in both poems the same fascination with the intrinsically poetical object, dappled grass, pine woods, fading loveliness, and love hypostasized. The same tendency toward languorous sorrow, but in Joyce sometimes sharpened towards the wry and resigned. 
the same unreal, unspecified fair ladies. In what sense were these unreal conventions a necessity? To confront that question is to confront the complete debility of taste with which both poets were surrounded, the taste which exalted Tom Moore and Lon Tennyson, and committed to the young for admiring memorization the kind of thing parodied in Stephen Hero. Art thou real, my ideal? Wilt thou ever come to me in the soft and gentle twilight with your baby on your knee? The ludicrous waddling approach weighed down by an inexplicable infant, Stephen Hero. It was a situation no poet in that time and place could escape. Yeats could not escape it, and their first strategies for dealing with it are strikingly similar. Joy supplies to the conventions of the popular opera in the musical. The musical, not poetry, a criticism of life, he wrote in an early notebook, a Johnsonian precision and elegance. Nor have I known a love whose praise your piping poets solemnize, neither a love where may not be ever so little falsity. Let us invest our emotions here, he says, since there is no other place to invest them. But let us preserve our critical consciousness intact and derive pleasure from that. While the pleasure becomes less ironic as the materials assume wider connotations, the materials remain the same to the end of Joyce's life. The situations in The Portrait, in Ulysses, in Finnegan's Wake, are the tawdry confrontations of melodrama and pulp romance. The conventionality of Bloom's pose erect, clutching a stick, over the recumbent Stephen, and the sentimental apparition of the dead Rudy in trappings of pantomime innocence belong to a deliberate technique, the structural counterpart of a sotisier texture. The Yeatsian strategy resembles that of chamber music, with the proportions reversed. Yeats too invests his emotions in roses and long, soft hair, not, however, because the present sings about these things, but because the past did. He provides them, via the pre-Raphaelite poise and the heroic legends of Ireland, with a distinguished pedigree. When my arms wrap you round, I press my heart upon the loveliness that has long faded from the world. The roses that of old time were woven by ladies in their hair, the dew-cold lilies ladies bore through many a secret corridor. This vanished loveliness versus the irredeemable modern is Yeats's theme. That the Stephen Dedalus of the portrait elects instead the loveliness that has not yet come into the world doesn't, of course, diminish the identical aestheticism of his pose. The effort of will by which the inviolable status of Yeats's illusions is maintained is as evident as his rejection of contemporary experience. Of old the world on dreaming fed, Grey truth is now her painted toy. They are dreams, he knows, but he is determined to preserve them, and the aristocratic dignity in which they are articulated is a preservative, not a criticism. There is a good deal of men of dignity in the early Joyce, of course. It is written across his biography, and traces of it get into his work. One reason chamber music doesn't really come off is that the author, for all his irony toward the glamorous, feels an irony still greater toward the quotidian. The Yeats of 1899 did represent in many ways an ideal for the Joyce of 1904. At 19, Joyce praised The Wind Among the Reeds as in aim and form poetry of the highest order. But the praise is checked, even then, by the tart phrase, an aesthete has a floating will. A few years later, in the act of recording the fascination of Ahern and Rabartes, he indicates their sterility. Civilization may be said indeed to be the creation of its outlaws, but the least protest against the existing order is made by the outlaws whose creed and manner of life is not renewable even so far as to be reactionary. These inhabit a church apart. They lift their thuribles wearily before their deserted altars. Stephen Hero, and assesses with detachment the sort of person who will believe in them, a young man like Stephen in a season of damp and unrest. In the portrait, he devalues the indissoluble mirror of polished steel by equipping Stephen Dedalus with waxen wings and a bleeding heart. The Catharsis 
Joyce was never the Stephen Dedalus of his 1914 portrait, mirror of 19th century romantic idealism. Byron, Shelley, Axel, Frédéric Moreau. He was for a time, however, approximately the Stephen of the 1905 Stephen Hero, a gayer, though by no means less intransigent being. During those months, he was in the greatest danger of his artistic life. Against the more magnetic danger later, he was on guard. But the Stephen Hero role was indefinitely implausible, as Yeats's later career illustrates. Stephen Hero isn't, as his relations with Cranley and Lynch imply, insulated from human contacts in the manner of his later namesake, and his intransigence is focused on his art. It is focused on his art, however, by way of his persona. You cannot contemplate your material and yourself at the same time. By the time he came to copy out the Stephen Hero manuscript, Joyce was sufficiently detached from, or at least uneasy about, the pretensions of his slightly earlier self to insert devaluing phrases like this fantastic idealist, the fiery-hearted revolutionary, this heaven-ascending essayist. It is a worthwhile guess that the writing out of Stephen Hero was the crucially cathartic labour of his life. The pain of depersonalization was undergone then, once and for all. Stephen Hero bogged down in 1906, a few pages past the end of the published fragment. Its necessity was past. After several more years, Joyce discovered how he could salvage its materials for the great trilogy. What was achieved in this time of maturation was what Mr. Elliot has described as the separation between the man who suffers and the mind which creates. The stiffness, the intransigence, was to be reserved for disciplining words and seeing that the printers didn't tamper with them. The personality was to be unbound and deployed as a perceptive medium. How powerful were the impulses forcing Joyce toward the almost inevitable error of living the part of artist we may perhaps guess from the degree of technical rigour that, at the time of dissociation, got transferred from the role to the workroom. Of the components of Stephen Hero, he retained the uncompromising craftsman who, out of the infinite number of ways of saying anything, was to seek out the best, spending a day on two sentences of Mr. Bloom's and 20,000 hours his own estimate, writing the 700-odd pages of Ulysses. On the other hand, this kind of thing was purged away. Behind the rapidly indurating shield, the sensitive answered, Let the pack of enmities come tumbling and sniffing to my highlands after their game. There was his ground, and he flung them disdain from flashing antlers. Mr. Spender has somewhere recorded a mild rebuke of Mr. Eliot's, which turned on the distinction between wanting to write poetry and wanting to be a poet. To write poetry, one bends one's attention, in trusting detachment, upon these present things. To be a poet, one concentrates on preserving integrity in a milieu one dare not trust. This means, at its most vulgar, Bloomsbury and transition a radical intercorruption of art and life. At its best, it means bringing aristocratic insolence and inner yearning to the highest possible temper, as Yeats, to his lasting glory, managed to do. Yeats as Tragic Hero As we know from his later work, Yeats did not rest, as a reader at the turn of the century might have expected. There was nothing to do with that marvellous coherent dream world, but repudiate it in sorrow, and that was the step Yeats took with unprecedented heroism. Thenceforward he became a tragic hero, and himself repudiating illusion, or defiantly entertaining it, became his subject. This meant not giving up the use of masks, but making a new set. He at length repudiated, like Stephen Dedalus, Rabarti's loveliness that has long faded from the world. Like Stephen, he meant by this act that he would repudiate the lilies and roses, and in contact with life, spin a new heroic dream out of his inside. He did something like that in, for instance, Byzantium. He regarded the form of pose as mistaken. As he shows by his endless tinkering with a theory of masks, he never questions the need for a pose. Joyce, in regretting, as he did to Eugene Jolard, that the materials of a vision hadn't been put into a great creative work, 
put his finger on Yeats's paradoxical sterility. A mask, he saw, was strictly a technical device, ancillary to other labours. The omniscient showman narrator in Ulysses, paring his fingernails, is one of the most extraordinary masks in literature. Yeats never saw the use of the mask. His integrity consists in his never having been deluded by its sufficiency. He had little vocation for the happiness which another Irishman called the capacity for being perpetually well deceived. His intelligence was too acute. In the Tables of the Law, Ahern discovers that the lex secretum of Joachim Abbas is a snare of the spirits whose name is Legion and whose throne is in the indefinite abyss. And in Lines Written in Dejection, an older Yeats laments, The holy centaurs of the hills are vanished. I have nothing but the embittered sun, banished heroic mother moon, and vanished. And now that I have come to fifty years, I must endure the timid sun. Yeats, Daedalus, and Mr. Duffy The career of Yeats, then, is that of a Stephen Daedalus who pursued his premises to the end with uncompromising rigour, and the end, as Joyce understood in making use of the Icarus symbol, was cold water. Stephen in Ulysses has suffered some such dousing, dropped into the Sea of Dublin after his Paris flight under the auspices of a false exemplar. The portrait closes with him poised for the takeoff, invoking Daedalus. Old father, old artificer, stand me now and ever in good stead. And on June 16th, 1904, we find him meditating. Fabulous artificer, the hawk-like man. You flew. Where to? New Haven, Dieppe, steerage passenger. Paris and back. In his drunken stupor that night, he has, who will go drive with Fergus now, upon his lips. His new condition, sea bedabbled, fallen, weltering, leaves him, that is, simply where Yeats was a little before 1912, uttering heroic phrases while seething with self-mistrust. There is a legend that on first meeting Yeats about 1902, Joyce said, You are too old to learn from me. Whether he said it or not, note, since Joyce always denied this story, the only authority for it is Yeats, who may have invented it to cap a preface he wrote in 1903 but discarded unpublished. Joyce isn't named in the preface, which dramatizes a pair of opposing theories, and Yeats's way of making a great anecdotal peacock out of the merest impressions has often been remarked. Whether he said it or not, it was perfectly true. Nothing lay before Yeats by then but a wonderfully resilient dryness. Lacking Yeats's intellectual recklessness, the most Stephen Dedalus could have hoped for was the drab, pottering future of Mr. Duffy in a painful case. Mr. Duffy is surely Stephen, come to a truce with Dublin, and grown old. In the desk lay a manuscript translation of Hauptmann's Michael Kramer, the stage directions of which were written in purple ink, and a little sheaf of papers held together by a brass pin. In these sheets a sentence was inscribed from time to time, and, in an ironical moment, the headline of an advertisement for bile beans had been pasted onto the first sheet. Joyce, in his nineteenth year, had in fact translated Hauptmann, and the Bile Beans folio is an ironical fulfilment of Stephen's Epiphanies on green over leaves, deeply deep, copies to be sent if you died to all the great libraries of the world, including Alexandria. The schizophrenia out of which the mature Yeats made art is represented in Mr. Duffy by a few futile gestures. He lived at a little distance from his body, regarding his own acts with doubtful side glances. He had an odd autobiographical habit which led him to compose in his mind from time to time a short sentence about himself containing a subject in the third person and a predicate in the past tense. He never gave alms to beggars and walked firmly, carrying a stout hazel. He works in a bank. Mr. Duffy and Yeats are contraries, but like all contraries, they belong to the same species. 
Joyce here makes it perfectly clear that the elevation of Dublin into intellectual light is not the privilege of one who fosters a timid isolation. Mr. James Duffy lived in Chapel Lizard because he wished to live as far as possible from the city of which he was a citizen, and because he found all the other suburbs of Dublin mean, modern, and pretentious. These words, with the understanding they imply, were written when Joyce was twenty-three. Too much cannot be made of such a fact. A just comprehension of his astonishing achievement must begin with a realisation that, within a year of writing chamber music, he was able to write Dubliners. His imagination had arrived at the point Yeats was only to reach at fifty, and passed beyond it while young enough to profit.